Hi, this is Dr. Rebecca Wood, and I would like to welcome you to the Week 5 Lecture. This week we will be speaking about writing about poetry and reflecting upon historic contexts. A poem is a portrait or a snapshot of a single moment in time. How can we take a poem, read each word with care, and make it ours in the moment of that reading, or possibly make it ours tomorrow in another moment of reading? How can we draw out the meanings embedded by the author? Are there words that have more than one meaning? Or possibly the same words mean different things in different parts of the poem? Should we read the poem out loud? Why, yes, we should. Should we read it silently? Yes, we can. Could we imagine it or sing it as a song? Yes, we can do that too. Could we try reading it with someone else if we can find someone who's interested in reading it with us? That would be terrific. Our first author this week is Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She was born in 1825. She was an educator as well as a writer and worked as an abolitionist and activist with John Brown, Ida Wells Barnett, and Harriet Tubman, among others. Her powerful poem, Bury Me in a Free Land, ends with these lines. I ask no monument, proud and high, to arrest the gaze of the passers-by. All that my yearning spirit craves is bury me not in a land of slaves. Writing about poetry is something we should think about this week as we continue our papers and um, as we look forward to the end of this class when hopefully we can write a little more about literature and enjoy analyzing it. So when we write about poetry, we can start with several powerful lines and then tell our audience what we think of them. I prefer using long or block quote format to document lines of poetry, even if the passage is shorter than a standard block quote, which some rules say is about 100 words. Depending on our writing assignment, we may have a single poem as our source, or we may be asked to compare and contrast more than one literary work in the same paper or essay. And please see my example on the next slide, which I wrote myself, and therefore I'm only documenting the sources that I used to write it. Frances Harper was in many ways fortunate, despite losing her mother at a young age. She was educated in a school headed by her uncle, and then went on to publish poetry and fiction, work as an instructor at Union Seminary, and travel as a lecturer for the abolition of slavery along with Frederick Douglass and other well-known abolitionists. The last line of her poem, Bury Me in a Free Land, strongly show the depth of her passion for freedom for all Americans. I ask no monument, proud and high, to arrest the gaze of the passers-by. All that my yearning spirit craves is bury me not in a land of slaves. Even though Harper worked her entire life to build a reputation as a scholar, writer, wife, and mother, these lines explain that her most important life's work was that of an abolitionist. She did not care about a fancy cemetery monument for future admirers to visit or to become rich and famous from her work. Her ultimate goal was that the United States be would become a free land, not a land of slaves. And so, after the hard work of the abolitionists and a terrible civil war in the United States, freedom was declared at last, in two steps. President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, and then the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution was ratified after the Civil War on December 6, 1865. How do the literary works written before these dates differ in tone and substance from those written after these dates? Our next author is George Marion McClellan who was a minister, teacher, fiction writer, and poet, and he was highly educated and a man of deep faith. His poem, The Feet of Judas, gives us a very strong message about forgiveness. It repeats the line, Christ washed the feet of Judas five times, which once at the beginning of each of the four stanzas of the poem and at the end of the fifth stanza, the very end of the poem. 
This repetition is like the chorus in a song, repeated not because he had nothing to say, but because he was emphasizing those repeated words. This poem strongly reminds the audience that Judas betrayed Jesus, and Jesus would have already known of that betrayal, yet Jesus bowed down and washed his feet, forgiving him for his terrible sin, a sin that was result in Jesus' painful and humiliating crucifixion. How could we interpret this poem? How much could McClellan have expected his audience to forgive? Were his expectations realistic? Our next author is Josephine Delphine Henderson Hurd. She was the daughter of North Carolina slaves and was well educated and traveled the world with her husband. Her poem, They Are Coming, tells the story of slaves bursting from their bonds in rice fields and plantations as they are crying, crying loudly, oh for justice. Again we have a refrain or chorus, such as in a song or hymn, of They Are Coming filling our imagination with a grand procession of people demanding freedom, equality, and justice. The powerful ending of They Are Coming goes like this. They are coming, coming, singing. Their thanksgiving hymn is ringing, for the clouds are slowly breaking now away, and there comes a brighter dawning. It is liberty's fair morning. They are coming, surely, coming, clear the way. Yes, they come, they're stepping steady, and their power is felt already. God had heard the lowly cry of the oppressed, and beneath his mighty frown, every wrong shall crumble down, when the right shall triumph and the world be blessed. What do you think about this poem? One more author I've added as a, an enrichment to our class is Alexandre Dumas. He was born in 1802 in France, and his grandfather was a Marquis, and his grandmother was a Haitian slave. His father, General Thomas Alexandre, fought in Napoleon's army until they had a serious disagreement about military strategy, and then the general was imprisoned and died shortly after his release. So Alexandre did not know his father very well. However, he wrote some fabulously successful and exciting novels, including The Three Musketeers and The Man in the Iron Mask. These novels were inspired by his father's military exploits and adventures and his imprisonment. The novel The Three Musketeers has become a classic that has been read and watched by millions of people throughout the years since it was first published in 1844. If you get a chance to read or watch this exciting story, please keep in mind that Dumas was an author of the African diaspora. How might that knowledge inform our reading or viewing? And as usual, I have a works cited page on my presentation, and so you can see I have document quite a few, documented quite a few sources on this presentation. So I hope that you have found it informative and enjoyable, and that uh, you all have a wonderful week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.